Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today, we will be discussing the fire and capsizing of the beautiful French ocean liner and fierce competitor of RMS Queen Mary, SS Normandy. Stay tuned for a detailed recollection of her entire story from start to finish. Quick disclaimer for our younger audience before we dive in. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, wartime violence, and debt that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised for those under the age of 13. Please keep in mind that I'm not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I've done my research. Okay everyone, let's get into it. I've been getting requests for Normandy since the conception of Shipwreck Sunday, and today is her day. SS Normandy came about during a time when immigration in the U.S. was greatly reduced after the Immigration Act of 1926, and so immigration was no longer the bread and butter of the transatlantic passenger trade. So what were ocean liners going to do? Instead, they would focus on tourism, luxury, and the escape of the American prohibition for many first-class American tourists who could afford a bougie trip to Europe. SS Normandy is considered a superliner, which is just a really big ocean liner, bigger than those of the Edwardian period. Cunard and White Star Line were also planning their own superliners at this point, but as we know from covering RMS Olympic, it didn't pan out for some of these ships. Two German vessels, SS Bremen and SS Europa of the Norddeutscher Lloyd Line, were two record-breaking, highly successful superliners of this era. So to compete in this new market, the French line, also known as Compagnie Générale Transatlantique, began to plan their own superliner. We'll be calling them the French line going forward because I'm very American and struggle with French, just for clarity. At the time, the French line's flagship was the illustrious SS Ile de France, an Art Deco ocean liner launched in 1926 with a sleek, conservative hull design. The designers of this ship were hearkening back to earlier French line ships, creating a sleek, modern, yet reminiscent design that was a smash hit. If you'd like a video covering Ile de France, let me know in the comments. However, this isn't the direction that Normandy would go. She would be revolutionary. The French line was approached by a Russian man by the name of Vladimir Yorkovich. He was a former ship architect for the Imperial Russian Navy, and he'd emigrated to France sometime after the Russian Revolution in 1917. His newest idea for bow construction is still used to this day, and a variation of it was even used on RMS Queen Mary II of the Cunard line. He had the idea of a slim, hydrodynamic hull working in tandem with a slanting, clipper-like bow with a bulbous forefoot just beneath the waterline. In testing with scale models, his idea turned out to be downright superior in performance to most other hull designs. Ironically enough, he'd approached Cunard with this idea first, but they turned him away. The bow was too radical for their tastes. The French line decided they'd go for it and jump in with both feet. They commissioned artists to make posters and publicity for the next beautiful liner of their fleet, with one of the more famous of these posters being made by Adolphe Moron Cassandre, who also was a Russian emigrant to France like the ship's architect. A poster made by Albert Sabille really displays the interior layout, with a cutout that looks like they took a slice out of it like a cake. The cutaway diagram was about 15 feet long, and really gave the viewer the chance to explore the ship before ever setting foot on deck. This poster is still on display at the Musée National de la Marine in Paris, France. The work was done by the Société Anonyme de Chantiers de Penouet in Saint-Nazaire, and I sincerely apologize to every native French speaker for making you cringe. At the time construction began on January 26, 1931, SS Normandy had yet to be named. Her construction began shortly after the stock market crash of 1929, also known as Black Tuesday or the Crash of 29. If you don't know what Black Tuesday is, here's the Cliff Notes version. 
it was a major American stock market crash that occurred in the fall of 1929, beginning in September and lasting all the way into mid-November. And this is when share prices on the New York Stock Exchange utterly collapsed. It is still considered the most devastating stock market crash in the history of the United States, given all the other extenuating circumstances. This crash followed the London Stock Exchange's crash in September and would be only the beginning of the Great Depression. While SS Normandy's construction was given the green light, White Star Line's newest ocean liner, RMMV Oceanic, which was to be well over a thousand feet long and had already begun construction before the crash, was canceled and her hull was scrapped. Cunard Line paused construction on RMS Queen Mary due to financial difficulties, but the French line pushed forward, though they did run into a few hiccups and ended up asking the French government for a subsidy. This subsidy would be heavily questioned by the French press. Even with this eyebrow-raising moment for the public and press, they still were heavily invested in the new ocean liner and her construction, since she was destined to represent France in the competition of wonderful superliners, and they were proud of their French-built ship. She was truly 100% French too, a French company in a French shipyard and made with French materials. Definitely something her country could be proud of. At this time, the hull laid on January 26, 1931, was simply known as her contract name, T-6. If you're wondering why T-6, it's because T stands for Transat, which is an alternate name for the French line, and 6 for 6th. There were a lot of names tossed around before they'd settle on Normandy, including Domer, after the recently assassinated president of France, Paul Domer, and their first choice, La Belle France, which would mean the French Belle. Finally, they'd settle on what we know her as, SS Normandy. There's a bit of history here on French maritime culture, and I'm going to cover that now. But if you're French and I get some details wrong, please leave a comment correcting me. In France, boat prefixes are not inherently feminine like they are in English. In English, we have one word for the, but in many languages, French being one of them, they have words that have masculine and feminine genders, and so they use multiple variations of the word the. In French, the masculine word for the is le, spelled L-E, and the feminine word for the is la, spelled L-A. They determine which the to use based upon the gender of the word they are describing, and this includes the names of ships. Most non-sailors in France use the masculine form since the French terms for boat can be four different masculine words. Pacbo, navire, bateau, or bâtiment. This is important because the French line's clientele was primarily rich Americans, and they referred to their ships as she, mostly, and so the French line determined they would just call the ship Normandy, no the. This way they'd avoid confusion with their French citizens and American clientele alike. Let's cover her specs. SS Normandy was 79,280 gross registered tons up until a 1936 refit, and after this she displaced 83,423 gross registered tons. She'd be the largest ship in the world when she was launched. She was 1,029 feet long, had a beam of 117 feet and 10 inches wide, a height of 184 feet tall from the keel to the top of her funnels, a draft of 36 feet and 7 inches when loaded, and a depth of 92 feet to the promenade deck. She spanned 12 decks total and was capable of carrying 1,972 passengers, 848 first class, 670 tourist class, and 454 third class with a complement of 1,345 crew members. She was powered by a turboelectric transmission system with four turbo generators and electric propulsion motors which were built by Alstom of Belfort and capable of producing 160,000 to 200,000 horsepower. These engines were able to use full power running reverse as well as being easier to control and maintain and quieter than most normal engines. The engine installation had a drawback of being much heavier, however it could still operate slightly less efficiently while maintaining fast speeds with one engine down. With this system, they were able to eliminate a stern turbines altogether. She'd begin her career as a triple screw ship, but after her refit, she would add a fourth propeller. She was designed to reach a maximum speed of 29.5 knots, which is incredibly fast. For example, most modern cruise ships run speeds between 20 knots up to a maximum of 30 knots, so SS Normandy was on par with modern-day ships in that department. 
As for safety equipment, of course she had enough lifeboats for everyone and an early form of radar was installed on board to deter collisions. As for the luxurious, bougie interiors of SS Normandy, you could expect nothing less than the best. I am typically not a huge fan of Art Deco interior or streamlined modern style, but I make an exception for SS Normandy. One of the founders of the Art Deco style, architect Pierre Patou, designed the interiors for SS Normandy, and with this he included sculptures and wall paintings that depicted Normandy, the province of France that the ship was named after. The public rooms were huge and elegant, hearkening back to that level of luxury you'd expect on liners like Mauritania, Lusitania, or the Olympic class. The ceilings were tall and grand, like you'd see in a hotel, and this is because the funnel uptakes split along the sides of the ship instead of going straight upward, and this allowed more room in the center of the ship to really vault those ceilings. This is huge because it makes it feel like so much more than just a ship, but rather like something you could find on land. For the majority of the decorative scheme, we have French architect Roger Henry Expert to thank. A lot of the open public spaces on SS Normandy were reserved for the first class passengers. The first class dining room was so beautifully decorated and clearly lit with chandeliers that SS Normandy would gain the nickname the Ship of Light, similar to how the city of Paris is called the City of Light. Her deck design and funnels were genius too. Her third funnel was a dummy funnel, and so they used it to conceal the kennels and the air conditioning units, keeping the ship sleek and beautiful. To add to the sleek, beautiful design, her forecastle and top deck were integrated within the ship itself, and this maximized open deck space for passengers. As for SS Normandy's career, it was lengthy and highly successful. SS Normandy left for her maiden voyage on May 29, 1935, with a crowd of 50,000 onlookers waving goodbye to her as she left La Havre. She was aiming to break records this crossing, specifically to retrieve the blue ribbon from the Italian ocean liner SS Rex. If you're unfamiliar with the Blue Ribbon, it's an unofficial accolade that is given to the passenger liner that can cross the Atlantic Ocean the fastest. You can get the Blue Ribbon for either westbound or eastbound crossings or for both. Under the command of Captain René Ponet, SS Normandy would achieve her goal, reaching New York City in four days, three hours, and two minutes, crushing the record of SS Rex and becoming the pride of the French people. She averaged 29.98 knots on her maiden voyage heading west, and on the return voyage to France heading east, she averaged 30 knots. That is incredible. She broke the speed record for both the east and westbound crossings. During this maiden voyage, the French line refused any predictions that Normandy would capture the blue ribbon. I can understand that. Prepare for disappointment and your excitement when you win will be tenfold. However, by the time Normandy had reached America, there were already French medallions of the Blue Ribbon delivered to passengers and Normandy let a 30-foot-long blue pennant fly in the wind, proud of her achievement before it even happened. An eager crowd of 100,000 awaited Normandy in New York Harbor, and all of the passengers were immediately presented with a medal, signifying Normandy's victory on behalf of the French line. Her first year was a smash hit. However, the following summer in 1936, RMS Queen Mary of the Cunard Line hit the seas, and at over 80,000 tons, she'd take Normandy's place as the largest ship on the seas. To compensate, the French line refitted Normandy and made the ship longer by adding an enclosed tourist lounge on the aft boat deck. This made her 83,423 gross registered tons, exceeding Queen Mary's displacement by 2,000 tons, and it would once again make her the largest ship based upon length and displacement. Try again, Cunard! One of the craziest accidents I've ever covered happened next in SS Normandy's career. On June 22, 1936, SS Normandy was returning to France about one nautical mile off Ride Pier on the Isle of Wight. Above her, Lieutenant Guy Kennedy was flying a Blackburn B-5 Baffin, S-5162, a Flight A from RAF Gosport to be exact, and he was doing some torpedo dropping practice, and so the plane was swooping low. In one of the low swoops, he buzzed SS Normandy and collided with a derrick that was transferring a motor car which belonged to Arthur Evans, a politician from the UK. Normandy at the time was transferring the car to a barge alongside the ship, and so the aircraft actually smashed right into SS Normandy's bow. Thankfully, Horsey was injured but alive and was taken ashore by a tender boat. 
However, the wreckage of the plane would stay on Normandy until she sailed into La Havre, where a salvage team from the RAF would remove the wrecked plane. Evans's car was totaled in the accident, and this was later brought up in Parliament. As for Horsey, he'd be court-martialed, which is being brought into a military courtroom, and he was found guilty of two charges. Normandy would recover from the strange incident and would move on to greater things. Unfortunately, those greater things didn't include having the blue ribbon for long. In August of 1936, that pesky old Queen Mary took the blue ribbon from SS Normandy, averaging 30.14 knots. This was the birth of a fierce rivalry between these two ocean liners, with Normandy still remaining the largest ship on the ocean until RMS Queen Mary's younger sister, RMS Queen Elizabeth, would take that spot too in 1940. Remember that 1936 refit we talked about? As well as adding to her gargantuan size, they'd work on her to reduce vibration at speed, which is something Lusitania had to go through as well. This is when her three bladed screws were replaced by four bladed ones and structural modifications to her lower aft section took place. And this would end up reducing vibrations when she was traveling at high speeds. In July of 1937, SS Normandy reclaimed the blue ribbon with her captain sending a message that Sheikly said, quote, bravo to the Queen Mary until next time. This legendary rivalry should have continued well into the 1940s, but unfortunately, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. And in this case, it was World War II. I didn't know before researching that SS Normandy was supposed to have a sister ship. SS Normandy was, herself, rarely populated by more than 60% of her maximum capacity. But despite this, she was financially successful enough to not need yearly government subsidies. Despite the minor successes financially, she never made enough revenue to pay back the loans it took to build her. Even with all of this financial food for thought, the French line was still planning on going ahead with a sister ship for her SS Breton, which was supposed to be even larger and longer. There were two camps for the design, both opposing one another. One incredibly safe and conservative, which would essentially be a slightly larger carbon copy of SS Normandy with only two funnels and the other was more bougie and radical, and it would be proposed by Normandy's designer, Vladimir Yorkovich. And it was a streamlined, sleek design with two twin funnels placed side by side instead of in a line like they traditionally were set. Of these two designs, the French line settled on the safer route. However, SS Bretagne would never happen due to the outbreak of World War II in September of 1939. We are going to talk more about that capacity issue and the popularity of SS Normandy here for a minute. With how critically successful she was because of the revolutionary design and decor, you'd expect people to fawn over her. However, this just wasn't the case. More passengers went with what was familiar, and this was provided by RMS Queen Mary. Two of SS Normandy's brilliant innovations actually turned out to be two of her downfalls, unfortunately. The first of these is that so much of her public passenger space was devoted to the first class, and this left the second and tourist class in the dust. Because of this, passengers assumed that she was a luxury ship built for the rich, famous, and elite. In contrast, RMS Queen Mary's spaces were equally split among the three classes, and they put as much thought into each of the classes as SS Normandy put into her first class, so this made Queen Mary the most appealing to American tourists escaping the prohibition. This would push second and tourist class into a major revenue source for shipping companies, and Queen Mary accommodated this much easier than SS Normandy. The second of these features turned fault is actually the decor inside SS Normandy. She was so sleek and had the latest modern Art Deco style that was seen as intimidating, uncomfortable, and too new for many of the passengers. Some even claimed the jazzy interiors was giving them headaches. Yikes. This wasn't a good look for Normandy, and again, Queen Mary was more appealing in this department despite also being in the Art Deco style, just a bit more toned down than SS Normandy. There are two reasons why SS Normandy was often either just around half her capacity or less. Her German rivals, SS Bremen and SS Europa, and her Italian rivals, SS Rex and SS Conti di Savoia, also suffered because of their innovative designs, all falling behind RMS Queen Mary in popularity. German and Italian ocean liners also faced scrutiny and boycotts due to the rising political tensions around the world with the Nazi party gaining power in Germany and with fascist ideals becoming popular in Italy. 
Normandy did not require government subsidies to continue operating like the Italian ships that were heavily funded by the government, with her income capable of covering her operating expenses and also generating a revenue of roughly 158 million francs. Francs were the legal currency of France from 1795 up until 1999, where they were switched over to the euro, which is their current currency and the currency of many European nations. Given a very complicated equation to figure out the inflation, I estimate 158 million francs in 1935 to be worth about 207,579,215 euros in 2023, or roughly 229 million fifteen thousand twenty-one dollars and eight cents. But no, I'm not a mathematician, so just be aware that I could be off a bit. Some of the few ocean liners that were actually profitable in the 1930s were Cunard White Star's MV Britannic, MV Georgic, and the antique RMS Aquitania, RMS Lusitania, and RMS Mauritania's little sister. These three weren't the only ones making it rain, however. The Holland America Line's SS New Amsterdam was also killing it on the North Atlantic. These four would ferry the lion's share of passengers across the Atlantic before World War II would begin. As many of us know, World War II officially began on September 1st, 1939 with Nazi Germany's invasion of Poland. At this point in time, SS Normandy was at Pier 88 in New York Harbor, seeking refuge in the U.S. from enemies hungry to sink her in Europe. She was interned by the federal government on September 3rd, 1939, the same day France declared war on Germany. Internment is the imprisonment of people, or in this case, SS Normandy, without charges or in the intent to file charges. It is typically used for the confinement of enemy citizens in wartime or of terrorism suspects, and usually large groups of people are interned. There were internment camps in the United States for Japanese people, which is often overlooked by American history books, but it is a very important thing to recognize. RMS Queen Mary would be tied up next to SS Normandy soon after she was interned, and RMS Queen Mary would serve as a troop ship during World War II. Two weeks after RMS Queen Mary hit the scene, RMS Queen Elizabeth would be tied up beside her in Normandy. This, dear listeners, meant the three biggest ocean liners in the world were lined up like ducks in a row, all at the same time, at the same pier. Normandy would remain under French control with French crew at the moor into 1940. During the Battle of France, there were rumors and threats of sabotage to SS Normandy, and so on May 15, 1940, the U.S. Treasury Department sent 150 agents of the Coast Guard to board SS Normandy and protect her from sabotage. During this period of time, the Coast Guard was a part of the U.S. Treasury Department during peacetime, and on November 1, 1941, the Coast Guard became a part of the U.S. Navy. The detail aboard SS Normandy remained for the time being, mostly observing while the French crew went about their duties and maintained the beautiful vessel. Five days after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 12, 1941, the Coast Guard pulled Normandy's French captain and crew and took possession of Normandy. You might be saying, but Eleanor, that's a French ship. How did the U.S. do that? Well, my friends, there's this thing called the right of angry. Angry is the right of a belligerent, in this case, the United States, to seize and use for the purposes of war or to prevent the enemy from doing so any kind of property, in this case SS Normandy, on belligerent territory, which in this case would be Pier 88 in New York Harbor. This includes what could belong to subjects of citizens of a neutral state as well. It seems strange for this to happen, but she was in American waters and so came under American purview, for better or for worse. The Americans would maintain steam in the boilers and other activities needed aboard the docked ship, like taking care of the machinery and other equipment. However, they would neglect and altogether abandon maintaining the fire watch system aboard SS Normandy that was designed to ensure any fire on board would be suppressed before it got out of control. Keep that in the back of your mind, shipwreckers. This crucial detail and misstep of the Americans will be important later. She wouldn't remain SS Normandy as a U.S. Navy sailor, however. The United States Navy would rename her for her wartime service. On December 20th, 1941, 13 days after Pearl Harbor, the auxiliary vessel's board officially recorded President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's approval of SS Normandy's transfer into the Navy. She was officially fighting in World War II for the Americans. She'd be turned into a troop ship like RMS Queen Mary, and the Navy actually put some really nice thought into what they named her. USS Lafayette. 
This was both in honor of the French general who fought on the colony's behalf in the American Revolution, Marquis de Lafayette, as well as the alliance with the French that made American independence a reality. There were other names thrown around, but USS Lafayette was the name settled upon, being approved by the Secretary of the Navy on December 31, 1941, and given the vessel classification of AP-53. She'd be converted into a troop ship at Pier 88, with the work being done by Robbins Dry Dock and Repair Company, a subsidiary of Todd Shipyards. They were awarded her contract on December 27, 1941, with the work being estimated for completion by January 31, 1942. Don't get too excited, her career in the Navy is almost laughable. Her prospective commanding officer was Captain Roger G. Coleman, and he was assigned to the beautiful French vessel on January 31, 1942. He'd oversee a skeleton crew of 458 engineers as they'd ease into running this advanced ship for her time. Due to the complications of the conversion process and the enormous size of the project, the crew was unable to adhere to their original schedule, and it also led to issues with the crew getting familiar with USS Lafayette. Additional crew was added in order to assist in this process, and on February 6, 1942, a request was put in to delay the first sailing of Lafayette by two weeks. Her sailing was originally set for Valentine's Day, February 14, 1942. On February 7th, orders came from Washington putting a kibosh to the two-week delay. They abandoned the idea of reducing the top hamper, and she was to set sail on Valentine's Day, like it or not. Because of this abrupt change of plans, the conversion work was frantically resumed, and Captain Coleman and Captain Simmers scheduled meetings on February 9th in New York and Washington, D.C. to try to get some clarification on the conversion plans, but these meetings wouldn't come to fruition. And neither would USS Lafayette's first sailing. On the day the meetings were scheduled to organize USF Lafayette's sailing, disaster would strike. At 2.30 p.m. on February 9, 1942, workman Clement Derrick was using a welding torch when the sparks flying off of it lit a stack of life vests ablaze. The life vests were filled with capoc, a flammable tropical tree native to Mexico, and these life vests had been stored in Lafayette's first-class lounge. There was still flammable varnished woodwork in the lounge that hadn't been removed yet, and quickly the fire lapped at this as well, spreading rapidly. Do you remember that pesky, neglected fire safety system we talked about earlier? Well, here's where that comes into play. The fire safety system was state-of-the-art for the time, but it was unfortunately disconnected while the Americans were converting the ship into a troop transport vessel, and so the fire was not contained by this. It would take 15 minutes before the local fire department would arrive, and in this time, the crew was fighting a losing battle against the blaze by manual means, which essentially is just buckets of water. New York City fire department trucks were on the scene quickly, but could not be connected to the water inlets of the French vessel because the American hoses didn't fit. This really dampened everything but the fire, and a northwesterly wind sweeping across the port quarter pushed the fire forward, feeding it and encouraging it. Within an hour of the ignition, the three upper decks were completely devoured by flames as black smoke twirled into the air and flames licked at the once beautiful ocean liner. At about 3.25 p.m., both Captain Coleman and Simmers arrived to see their ship up in flames. Firefighters on shore and fireboats in the harbor surrounded the ship, pumping tons of water onto the decks to put out the blaze. Unfortunately, this water would settle inside the ship, and Lafayette started to develop a list to port where the fireboats were showering water down upon her. She was now in danger of capsizing. Her designer, Vladimir Yorkovich, quickly arrived on scene to offer advice since he knew SS Normandy the best. Unfortunately, American Harbor Police barred him from getting close enough to really aid anything. He suggested that they enter Lafayette and open the sea cocks, which are valves on the hull of a boat or ship that permits water to flow into the vessel either for cooling an engine, a saltwater faucet, or for other various purposes. If they'd done this, the ship's lower decks would have flooded and she'd sink to the bottom of the port just enough so that she wouldn't capsize, since the port wasn't as deep as she was tall. If they'd done this, Lafayette would have been stabilized enough to pump water onto the parts of the ship that were ablaze and she could have been saved. This brilliant idea was rejected by Rear Admiral Adolphus Andrews, who was the commander of the 3rd Naval District. It's a pity that they didn't listen to the ship's designer. Who knows what would have happened had they done what he suggested. All I can tell you is what did happen. Between 5.45 and 6 p.m. on February 9th, sources differ. 
The authorities finally considered the fire on board Lafayette to be under control and they began pulling back firefighting operations until about 8 p.m. Sure, the fire wasn't a problem now, but Lafayette had a much more serious issue. Water was entering through submerged openings and flooding the lower decks, which utterly trumped any efforts to counter flood. You might not remember our definition of counter flooding if you haven't seen our episodes on Yamato and Musashi, so we will briefly cover that. Counter flooding is the act of flooding compartments in a ship to counterbalance listing and loss of trim, resulting especially from already flooding compartments. It's also sometimes referred to as tactical flooding. At this point, Lafayette's listing to port was beyond the point of no return. She was destined to capsize. Rear Admiral Andrews would order Lafayette to be abandoned just after midnight on February 10th, and Lafayette would continue listing. Her death had been hastened by 6,000 tons of water that had been added while fighting the fire. Eventually, the ship capsized during the mid-watch around 2.45 a.m., and in doing so, Lafayette damn near crushed a fire boat that was nearby. She came to rest on the bottom of the port, on her port side, at an angle of about 80 degrees. Rear Admiral Andrews then realized that this whole disaster would have been avoided if he'd only listened to Yorkovich, and so the capsizing was entirely his fault. Because of this, he barred any press from viewing the capsizing to lower the level of publicity it would gather. Unfortunately, one man did die during this incident. A member of the Firewatch, 36-year-old Brooklyn native Frank Trent Trent Acosta, may he rest in peace. Around 94 Coast Guard and Navy sailors, with some being from Lafayette's pre-commissioning crew as well as some assigned to the receiving ship USS Seattle, 153 civilians and 38 firefighters would be treated for various burns, injuries, exposure, and smoke inhalation due to the fire. Interestingly enough, this fire was caught on film in a movie. Alfred Hitchcock's 1942 film Saboteur featured the burning yet unidentified Lafayette in the background with the movie's antagonist grinning in the foreground, implying he was responsible for the ship's demise. Hitchcock later stated that, quote, the Navy raised hell about this implication and that their security was so poor that he could actually get an on film in the background. At this time, the eastern seaboard of the United States was being patrolled by and attacked by German U-boats, though this information was kept in the dark by the Navy, and they worried this film would let the cat out of the bag. Obviously it didn't, because I'm American and I learned about World War II in school numerous times and never knew about U-boats on the eastern seaboard until I started doing Shipwreck Sunday. What does that say about the American education system, my friends? There, of course, was an investigation into this ridiculous affair with enemy sabotage suspected but not proven. After a congressional investigation led by Democrat Representative Patrick Henry Dury from Virginia, it was found that the fire was entirely accidental. In this investigation, they found evidence of rule violations, carelessness, lack of clear command structure during the fire itself, a lack of coordination between the various parties on board, and as we know, a panicky, frantic, and poorly planned conversion operation. There were members of organized crime that tried to take credit for the sinking. If you're unclear, organized crime is referring to Italian mobsters in this case. There were rumblings that the mobster and power in the local longshoremen's union, Anthony Anastasio, had orchestrated the fire, meaning it would be arson, in order to provide leverage to release mob boss Charles Lucky Luciano. How would this help release Luciano, you might ask? Well, Lucky's end of the bargain would be that there would be no more sabotage on ports where the mob's influence was vast with the local unions. This hasn't been proven and isn't likely, but it's interesting to think about. The resulting salvage operation is still one of the largest and most expensive of its kind, being estimated to have cost $5 million in 1942, which would be about $92,587,730.06 in 2023 given inflation. That's a large chunk of change. For comparison's sake alone, Costa Concordia's salvage operation cost $1 billion, and it's the largest salvage operation to have ever taken place. During this intense salvage, Lafayette's superstructure was completely removed and she was turned right side up once more on August 7, 1943. She'd be reclassified as an aircraft and transport ferry APV-4 the following month on September 15, 1943. She was placed in dry dock in October in order to be repaired. 
However, there was such extensive damage to her hull, deterioration of the machinery from being submerged and damaged by the fire, and it would take so much manpower and money to repair the ship that were needed elsewhere in more critical war projects that it was determined to not be cost-effective to repair SS Normandy. She'd sit in disrepair in the Navy's custody until the end of World War II. Finally, she was stricken from the Naval Vessel Register on October 11, 1945, never having sailed for the United States Navy. President Harry S. Truman would be the one to authorize her disposal in an executive order on September 8, 1946, and she was sold for scrap about a month later on October 3rd to Lipset Incorporated. She was sold for roughly $161,680 in 1946, which would be $2,502,607.41 in 2023. The Navy and the French line were clueless and offered no ideas on how to scrap SS Normandy, but her designer was still hopeful and offered a solution. Cut her down into a mid-sized liner and restore her to her beauty. His offer failed to draw any potential investors, and so she would be scrapped. Her scrapping began in October of 1946 at Port Newark, New Jersey, and SS Normandy would be completely scrapped by December 31, 1948, disappearing forever. Although this is the end of her story, she is still remembered today for her innovation, beauty, and forward thinking. You can see elements from her design choices implemented today in all sorts of ships. Many ships have tall, vaulted ceilings and feel grand like modern hotels instead of like being in a vessel. And I personally believe we can thank SS Normandy for that. She wasn't the first, she wasn't the last, but she was iconic for her time. Hopefully this story keeps her legacy alive and we can all appreciate her for what she was. An iconic beauty and the pride of her nation. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a 5-star review, as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and to interact with us. And don't forget to check out our second channel, Speedforce Media. Tune in next Sunday for the sinking of MV Princess of the Stars, a passenger ferry that capsized in 2008, killing over 800 people. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.